have your attention. We're going to get started shortly. I just want to thank you all for being here and welcome you. If you don't know me, I'm Jackie Duda. I'm the health agent and I work for the Board of Health here in East Hampton. You sound like you're talking in an echo chamber. Can't help that. I'm not in charge of technology. Health? Yes. Technology? No. <laughs> If you're here, we especially appreciate that you're here because you're interested in the issue of smoking in East Hampton, and so are we. In fact, a smoking is a, a tobacco use is at a higher rate here in East Hampton than any of the surrounding communities per capita. So we're particularly concerned about that here in the health department, and we're doing a few things here and there to try to address the uh, the tobacco use in the city. We're doing this conference, and we've paid for the refreshments and other things with a grant from Cooley Dickinson Healthcare. So they're also interested in this. In fact, they approached us and asked if, asked if we wanted to work with them together. Um, I also want to give some acknowledgement to Sandra Mandel back there in the back of the room, who is the manager for this grant and arranged this conference and uh, got you all here. So thank you for coming. Our speaker tonight is attorney Chris Banton. Chris is with the Public Health Advocacy Institute, uh, which is part of the Northeastern North yeah. U University Law School. Chris is an expert on the subject matter. He works with a lot of public health uh, departments and boards of health across the state, and he has a wide breadth of knowledge on the subject matter. So I'll just introduce Chris and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you. That's a generous introduction for me. Let's see what I can do to try to earn that. Um, so, Cindra, can you go to the next slide, please? Absolutely. So, this is an overview of what I want to try to cover tonight. Um, the last thing I want to do is, is stay up here and, and just speak the whole time. So, you know, I'd love to get questions and comments throughout the presentation. I would just ask that. Um, you know, we'd be respectful and let everybody have a chance to comment and, and to not monopolize the whole conversation. So thank you. Um, you know, here's what I want to cover. A few things to consider. This is the sort of basic health and safety. Uh, I think everybody knows that secondhand smoke has an adverse health effect. But how dangerous it is is still kind of unknown. It's relevant for you as landlords. Can I, who here's a, a landlord or, okay, um, condos, folks, do you have any condos as well? Condos, okay, I'll talk about that as well. Um, it's relevant because it's not just those, you know, long-term effects of lung cancer and things way down the road, but it's also the things that happen right away. You know, the asthma attack, stroke, heart attack, things like that. So I'll, I'll dive into a little bit of detail on that. Uh, the big question for a lot of folks is what's this going to do to my bottom line, my business of being a landlord? So I want to talk a little bit about that as well. And it also has uh, ramifications for condominiums. You know, there's an economic change here. Uh, so I'll talk about that. Process of going smoke-free. Th this is my recommendations for implementation. All right, so that's, we'll, we'll talk in depth about, in depth about that. Enforcement and compliance, that's always the big question. Is this rule, is anybody going to follow this rule? Is this thing going to work? How do I enforce it? And we'll talk about that too. And trends, I'll just touch on this. Yeah, and I can even kind of give you the short answer now. Trends, this is, you know, what's happening in the marketplace and what's happening in our state house and our, in our boards of health, our regulators, what are they thinking? In the marketplace, lots of places are going smoke free. Um, this is quite a trend, not just in Massachusetts, but across the country. Uh, as far as um, you know, proposed legislation and proposed regulation, not a lot out there. Not a lot out there. This is a voluntary thing. Um, okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, next slide, please. So you got a lot of things that are uh, combusted in the home. Right, um, and this rule that I'm going to talk about tonight, it's not a new rule. Right, this thing has been around for a long time. It's, has anybody ever heard of the no burn rule? No candles, no incense, no smoking. Been around for for a little bit of while. Uh, so anyway, um, where does tobacco fall on that? 
Well, it's, you know, you decide. Um, next slide, please. Um, I have this slide to give you a sense of all of the effects that make the air circulate throughout your building. I mean, you know this because you probably get complaints about people smelling other people's cooking smells, right? Um, and so there are a lot of effects going on here. You have the wind effect, you have convection, the heat and cool rising, you have the active ventilation system. All of those effects um, determine how air flows from unit to unit, when it goes up and down. You know, typically, you think of smoke rising, right? And the heat rising in a building, so it would go up. And it does. A lot of people may say, okay, I put the smoke on the top floor and the smoke will go up. But you get unusual air effects where it can be circulated throughout a building. Let's say you have a common heating, heating system in a, an old house that's been divided up into units. Uh, you're going to get smoke throughout the building. Um, plus, smoke, part of smoke, it's, it's a gas, right? It's a particulate matter and it's gas. And when you put gas in a room, like a, like a vapor, it expands to occupy the room. And the second hand smoke will do the same thing. Uh, next, next slide, please. And so here's a unit in that building, right? And the arrows are airflow. And you may be thinking, wow, that's a leaky, that's a leaky uh, that unit. But it's not, right? You need to have a certain amount of airflow in your building, in your units, to keep mold down. In fact, the sanitary code talks about air exchanges and things you need to have to make sure you have air moving from unit to unit. And that is a good thing. But it also carries cooking smells. It carries secondhand smoke. Um, I get a lot of calls from landlords who say, can I seal up the unit? Actually, it's, it's more, where are you? I ask them, where are you at? And they say, well, I've sealed up the unit, but that's not helping. And that's true. I mean, it's rare that sealing up the unit actually helps. Plus, you run the danger of sealing it up and getting mold and stuff like that. Um, so this is kind of suggestive of the fact that, look, you're not going to, there's not a good mechanical fix here uh, to addressing smoke going from unit to unit. Um, next slide. I won't go through all this stuff. There's a, there's a lot of things. This is a breakdown of, of secondhand smoke. So we're talking about stuff goes from unit to unit, including secondhand smoke. So here's what's in it. You have a gas phase, you have a particulate. Um, you got a lot of stuff in secondhand smoke that's not too good. Um, this is the important part, right? Secondhand smoke is a class A carcinogen. So what does that mean? That means there's no known safe level of exposure. Okay, so what does that mean? That means when you ask yourself, okay, what's a, when do I have to worry about this? When do I have to worry about smoke going from unit to unit? You're not going to find a bright line, safe level of exposure. It's a class A carcinogen. So that means if you can smell it, it's bad for you. Um, anybody know what some other class A uh, chemicals are? Take a guess. Asbestos, benzene, like that. You know, the really bad ones. Like if you had to open asbestos in your unit, you'd be in trouble. You'd want to seal that up right away, get rid of it, abate that. Um, so, you know, you really have this, yes, a lot of people smoked, they used to, and some people still do, um, but it's, you know, it still doesn't mitigate the fact that it's very really dangerous. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so we talked about this, right? We have we had smoke going from unit to unit. We have it in the unit. Once it gets there, it stays there for a long time, right? We go to work. Our workplaces are smoke free, and then we come home, and our and our places, our our homes are often not smoke free. So there was a study. I don't have a bullet point on this, but there's a study done in Massachusetts, and it looked at two groups of kids. And the groups of kids were exactly the same. Mom and dad or grandma or whoever the caregiver was, wasn't smoking in the house. You know, they were living in a smoke-free house. The only difference between the two kids was one group lived in a building like this, 
and another group lived in single detached family dwellings. Guess which group had nicotine or, or to metabolized form of nicotine in their blood to the tune of almost like a cigarette a day? Guess which group? multi -nutrile. Yeah. So that's a lot of exposure. Um, even when mom and dad are doing everything right, you have this level of exposure. I, you know, it's, it, it is an issue. You have smoke coming from the other team there. Uh, some people, you know, will say, can I put an air filter in? You can try it, right? A smoke eater, that's not going to do it. You could try some HEPA filter, charcoal filter, and actively manage it, like a hospital grade one. Yes, I would probably give you some relief. Um, but often I've heard people try it and it doesn't work. There's still exposure. Um, next slide. So, okay. We have our building, and it's a good building. And it's up to code. Board of Health Inspector comes over. It's great, no problem at all. Um, but you have smoke going from unit to unit. You're worried about it. What are some of the health effects that you are thinking about, that your residents are thinking about? Well, I talked about it a little bit earlier, right? You have this increased chance of both lung cancer and plenty of other cancers, too, breast, pancreas, you know, prostate, colon. A lot of these are connected with it. There's an association there. But also, stroke and heart attack. Um, and asthma, both an asthma attack and asthma induction, the actually creation of asthma as a, as a chronic disease, um, and other respiratory conditions. So you have these immediate health effects um, that people are, are worried about, um, and the risk of fire, too. Yeah? Is that statistic there in the second paragraph, the 25-30% increase in the risk of lung cancer, et cetera? That include the, the spillover, the, the units where it spills over through ductwork, et cetera, or is this just, I live in a home and my father smokes? What they did there is they, they surveyed non-smokers. And so they didn't break it down into exactly where they live, but it was non-smokers exposure. So you're right, it might be, it, it might be a that's, little bit less. That's a minimum. Well, I mean, if yeah, you're in a yeah. unit with somebody who's smoking, it's going to be higher. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the concentrations will probably be higher. I can't speak to the exact conditions of that. Um, but, you know, there are situations where you have smoke going to unit to unit and it's pretty high levels of concentration. Um, the risk of fire, though, that's certainly not contained to one unit. So, um, cig unattended cigarettes are the leading cause of fire-related mortality in Massachusetts, in every state in the country. And ironically, our cigarettes are supposed to be fire safe. They're, they're, they've mandated regulations supposed to be fire safe. They're not. Uh, ask your fire department. They're very worried about oxygen and, and fires because they have a lot of fires on this. And can you go to the next slide? So I, I just have one slide, but you can see that they, the, this is from the Plymouth Fire Department, Plymouth, Massachusetts. They pulled this couch out, and you can see the smoke here. I don't have the other slide that shows it pulled the cushions away. But what happens is people, you know, they drop an ember. And it sits there and it, and it smolders and smolders and they leave the room and then it, then it kind of catches on fire. Um, next slide. And so this is a unit uh, in affordable housing in Plymouth. And uh, you can see, it, it, I could show you the other pictures. It's totally destroyed. Does anybody want to guess what that is? Yeah. Guess. Anybody else? That's an oxygen line. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an oxygen line. Yeah. So that's, you know, what happens is the body becomes oxygen closed. It's actually a recommendation. If someone uses oxygen and smoke, they're supposed to take the oxygen off, turn it off, wait a certain amount of time. I think it's like 20 plus minutes for the oxygen to get out of their clothing, get off their facial hair, get out of the body, and then they can go have a cigarette. People don't do that. Right? So you get a lot of fires. Uh, very legitimate concerns about oxygen and smoking. Um, next slide. Okay, here, mom was doing everything right. She was out on the front deck, not inside, and she flicked her cigarette, and guess where it landed? 
Yes. Yeah. We we're, were seeing a dramatic increase in mulch fires because of smoke-free policies. So when we talk about what your rules should look like, it should definitely say get away from the building and get away from the mulch. And um, they actually just updated the mulch regs last year. The fire marshal's office, I think, issued an update on those because of this problem. Uh, so okay, no more no more scary fire slides. I, I promise. Um, next one, please. All right. Let's talk about the bottom line as far as financial. Okay. Uh, we knew this would be an important question, and so uh, we did basically uh, a political poll, Lisa Surveying Company, in Massachusetts to ask people about their preferences around uh, smoking in buildings. So demand, in other words. Um, and so the following slides are, are just a few bits of that. You have some in your handouts. We have a full copy of the report, too. So in the end, uh, when you fill out the evaluation form, please leave your email address because you can get all this in electronic form and, and other stuff. Um, so, yeah, so we did the survey. This was done in 2008. It's a random dial to your telephone survey. It's like a political poll, so it's statistically significant. It represents what's really out there. Or I should say it was out there in 2008. Um, and so with that, let's take a look at some of the next slide. Okay, so I'm looking for a place, right? You go to Craigslist, I guess. I haven't looked in a while. <laughs> you go to Craigslist or whatever the listing is. What do I think, I'm a typical person, what do I think um, when I see a place advertised as building-wide, no smoking rule? And here's the impression. I'm immediately more interested. You have captured almost 90% of the market. Most of them are more interested. These people are neutral. You have only 11.5 who say, uh, I don't like that. I'm going to move away. So anybody know what the smoking rate in Massachusetts is generally? It varies from town to town. It's about 18-16% right now. It used to be much higher. Not long ago, it was 40%. You know, really, relatively recently, 20, 30 years ago. So it's gone down quite a bit. So you actually have smokers who are either neutral or prefer a non-smoking building. Okay, let's try another one. What about if I go, okay, if I like a place, it wasn't advertised as smoke-free, but I'm going to go check it out. So I come over, and I walk in, and I go, hmm, stale cigarette smoke. How's that going to, what, what's that going to make me think? Um, I'm immediately less interested. Even people, you know, then 5% of people, presumably smokers, I'm not sure, who are, who are more interested. But that means you have a lot of people, about 14, 19%. Uh, so you have, it's immediate, an immediate turnoff uh, if they smell smoke. Not surprising, not surprising at all. Um, next slide, please. Okay, would you be willing to pay more? There's another measure of preference and demand. And you can see you have just over 40% are willing to pay more for a building that's no smoking building wide. Okay? Um, and you can see, the, here's a breakdown of how much more. So of those 40%, 60% of those would, be, would pay 10% more, and 30%, just under 30 would pay 20% more. So this is an amenity that people are looking for. So we've measured demand in a few ways, and the market report has some other examples of that. Let's, let's turn it over and look at supply, right? Because that's kind of the other side of the equation. So center for you. So this was in 2008. We measure this. You have this huge demand, not surprising because most people don't smoke, right? And most people are exposed in the workplace, so why at home? Um, you would think that supply would be bigger, right? Well, it is getting bigger. In the past two or three years alone, over 26,000 units of municipal housing have gone smoke free. Springfield, Austin, Greenfield, Wayland, North Adams, Lowell just went. Um, through the town? Yeah, through the town. So this is a municipal housing authorities. They as landlords decide to go. Oh, oh housing yeah. authorities. Yeah, yeah, housing authorities. Um, have, have any towns done, done it through the like, no. ordinance or anything? No, no, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. No, they haven't. Some out in California, actually. Uh -huh. None here, none here. 
Um, but, you know, what I'm getting at is the supply is increasing. And so I talked about municipal housing authorities, but you have a lot of private managers of affordable properties and, and you know, market rate and whole range and condos. So this supply is increasing, but it's certainly not meeting demand. So you have a high demand, relatively low supply still. It translates into economic opportunity. Not surprising people would be willing to pay more for it. Um, still, this isn't surprising, is it? You know, because not long ago, a lot of us used to smoke. So supply is catching up to demand. Next slide is surprising. You may be thinking, Chris, the person you're talking about is not renting in my properties. You know, I rent to someone completely different. I know who I rent to, and you're not talking about him or her. What we try to do to address that is we ask the people in the survey, tell us a little bit about yourself. How much do you make? You know, where did you get to high school, college, past that? You know, some things to help us understand who we're talking to. And one would expect with lower income, lower education, they tend to have higher smoking rates. That's just how it plays out you know, in Massachusetts and other, other states. But what we found is despite where you, you know, how much education you had or how much you made, there was still a pretty high demand across the board for this policy. That was a surprising piece of this survey. And since then, you know, I mentioned the municipal housing authorities have gone smoke free. Every one of them has done a survey of their residents before they went smoke free. Okay? And every one of those surveys turned out a very high percent of people in support of this, of residents. 75, 80, 85 percent, even 90 percent of residents and housing authority uh, say, yeah, we like this too. We think this is a good idea. I mention that because this is not just, you know, some guy with a PhD saying, I want to do <coughs> free. It's a demand across the board. It's a pretty strong demand right across the board. Um, next slide. Let's see where we're at. Okay, we also did, to give you a little insight to some landlords who have gone smoke free, and we'll talk about enforcement and, and how to go smoke free, but we also, in the survey in 2008, talked to about 350 landlords. And we asked them, okay, you went smoke free, was it a good idea? And we had 99% say, yes, it was a good idea. Pretty good, pretty good. 90% uh, said it was easy to implement. We actually asked them to break it down. <coughs> okay, so why is that the case? And, you know, tell us about vacancy, tell us about turnover, tell us about the cost of rehabbing a unit, disputes amongst residents, and all of these factors, when we asked them about them, improved. Uh, I think the main point that they focused on was the cost of rehabbing a unit where someone was allowed to smoke compared to a unit where someone was not allowed to smoke. Has anybody had that experience? Oh, yeah. Can you can you share with it a little bit? Oh, it's big time expense. You get a heavy smoker inside for several years. Yeah. It takes a lot to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, you were? We had um, a couple for maybe 10 years in a second story apartment. And um, she, the woman was smoking all the time, constantly. Oh, we tried to binge the apartment after she left. You could still, it could reek of smoke. You couldn't get rid of that smell at all. Yeah. Everything was yellow, it's gross. Particularly on a, like a wet day like this, it really pulls awful. that smell out. Yeah, just to clean it in the you know, yeah. getting it washed down. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's what I hear most. Um, do they do an ex exterior smoking area or something, these guys? Or? Well, let's, so let's get into that. Let's, let's talk about what the rule should look like. So, uh, well, first of all, it's legal to prohibit smoking. Smoking is, is not a protected right, okay, even in your home. It's not a protected right. The Constitution protects things like free speech, religion, philosophy, and, and the right to associate. But it's not going to give a heightened level of protection for smoking. So we'll just get out of the way. Um, next slide. All right, so let's let's talk about the rule. You asked about where people should go. Let's let's go right down and say, let's say, okay, you're thinking of you're gonna go smoke free, right? I've convinced you. Maybe you you've heard of others going smoke free. So now the next step is what should my rule look like and how should I implement it? So we'll start with what should the rule look like? The first thing is your rule says no smoking. 
not no smokers, no smoking. Okay? Um, that's what all your rules basically say. They say, this conduct is okay, that conduct is not okay. They never say, I want this type of person, not that type of person. Right? So that's, so same, here, same thing here. No smoking. Um, grandfathering. All right? Um, very few people do this. So by grandfathering, I mean your current residents who smoke. You say, okay, I'm going to let you smoke until you move out. You know, you live here for 10 years, fine, you can continue smoking for 10 years. Most people don't do this. The reason why is, if you grandfather someone, you're not a smoke-free property. Yeah, and it's, you were, you were going to say it's... It's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Have I'm you? the director of the housing authority. Oh, okay. And that's what we have. Oh, okay. We, we, would you mind sharing which... Well, yeah, okay. Housewife's a nightmare. I'm curious. Are you, are you, yeah. East Hampton House. Oh, East Hampton, I'm sorry. I didn't want to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, it, uh, so, I, I mean, from my experience, maybe, maybe we can want to share a little bit about it <laughs> with a hypothetical. I live in your unit, right? In your, one of your buildings, and, I, and I've been smoking for a while. And uh, I'm going to keep smoking, despite what my neighbors say. And guess what? I'm going to host a smoking party in my place. I'm where all the people go to smoke. And then let's say, let's say you have someone who comes in, or a new person, maybe she smokes. And she moves right next to me. And maybe she's smoking in the unit, and you go up to say, you know, we have this rule that you knew about when you moved in. See, here's where you signed on the lease. And now you're smoking. There's a good chance that she might say, it's not me, it's Chris next door, the guy who's grandfather. And by the way, his smoke is coming into my unit, and it's bothering. So it really, that, yeah, I mean, that's, it really complicates enforcement. I don't recommend doing it. Uh, the, uh, and, and most people, that places that go smoke free are not doing it at this point. Uh, okay, you asked about designated smoke. You know, where do they go? Okay, well, we know they're not going to smoke anywhere in the building, in any units. And we're not going to let them smoke on the deck. Maybe they have a, a deck off their unit. That's even worse sometimes because the smoke goes right back in the next unit. It's pulled right back in that the window of the unit or her butt. Um, we know we're not going to let them stand right outside the front door because they're going to set the mulch on fire or the smoke's going to go right back in. So you have some options. You have some options. You're going to move away from the building where you're going to ask people to smoke. Uh, you could say, you have to go off the property. Legally, you can say that go off the property. In fact, I would say most places do say that. You can also say you have to be 30 feet, or 20 feet, or 50 feet, whatever it is, away from any building. Uh, not a lot of places do that as much. Because honestly, who walks around with a tape measure and says I'm 50 feet away from the building? Uh, or you can designate a smoking area. Okay? Um, you know, a good number, good percentage of places designate a smoking area. It really depends on your property, depends on your residents. I mean, you make the rules, but you, you'll get input from your residents about this. Maybe as a housing authority, you have board members, and, you know. So you make a choice about this. Just a few thoughts on designated smoking area. If you're going to have this, don't have it right outside the front door. In fact, don't have it on the walk, like you from the parking lot to walk in. Don't put the designated smoking area there. You want to put it off to the side a little bit because you don't want people walking through the smoke, right? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing with the designated smoking area, and actually a buffer too, you're going to get people congregating out there, okay? And you're going to have the responsibility of dealing with this new area. So access, maintaining it, light, noise, that sort of thing. Maybe you want that there. Maybe you don't want that on the public sidewalk next to your neighbors. I don't know. That's you know your property. But you may have that issue. Um, and you know, when you have a designated smoking area, the problem is you're going to get smoke drifting back into the building, and people are going to see it. Where if you don't have it, you're more of a smoke-free property, and people are more likely to comply because you're more of a smoke-free property. Um, Okay, all buildings are some. I suggest being consistent across the board. Um, 
some places have had uh, smoking buildings and non-smoking buildings. So Worcester has, not, yeah, Worcester. Worcester Housing Authority has this. They started with two buildings. I think they have four now that are smoke-free. And they have, you know, the request to go back and forth. You have different treatment for different people depending on where they are. So my recommendation is you just be consistent, right? You're consistent with your other rules. Why would you make an exception here? Um, so those are some of the parameters of the rule. Um, let's keep going to the next slide. Let's see. Okay. You know what your rule's going to look like. Yeah. I have some question about that. Yeah. Um, what about people smoking in their car on the property? Oh, yeah. Good point. Thanks. Um, it, they're violating the rule. If you're sitting in your car and the property is totally no smoking, um, you're on the property. So they would be asked to move off the property. And that's what a lot of property management companies have done. There's a reason behind that. Yeah, well, I mean, if you close yourself and fishbowl yourself, that person's really going to absorb into their clothing. When they come back from the building, that smoke is, is being readmitted. So it's a little better to have them out, at least the car moving, or step out to fresh air or something like that. I'm in a condo situation, but still I think it applies in various ways. Someone, there's very few places people can smoke anymore, yeah. and I'm lifelong anti-smoker. But what if they're out and they're smoking in their car because that's the only place, and they, they are finishing up their cigarette, and they're drive, they drive home, and they park? I mean, I just don't well, I mean, if they, they, right, I mean, we have to be, we can't, Sit there's there. a certain amount of flexibility. Right. So if they're driving and they park, yeah. it, you know, that's, I don't, that's going to be um, tricky. sort of, in, well, tri but I was going to say an inconsequential sort of violation. No one's going to be, you know, say, oh, you're violating the rule, unless I were to create a problem. And I can't really see, let's say, like, flip the butts out the, out the, oh, out yeah. into the driveway, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, but let's talk about uh, marijuana. You know, should we include this in your rule? Well, this is a tricky one, right? Because... Um, Marijuana could provide, and I guess will provide, medical relief for folks. In fact, it's a medicine in Massachusetts, if you have your card, right? If you just have a bag or a joint, it's not a medicine until you have prescribed and you have a card, right? Uh, but let's say someone comes to you and says, um, you know, I, I've got my medical marijuana card. I don't want to talk about the medical conditions, but I need this for my, to, for treatment. Well. Let's talk about you know how you think that through. The first thing is, if you wanted to, could you say, well, you can't smoke in the property? And the legal answer is yes, you can say that for two reasons. Um, first, marijuana of any type is absolutely illegal under federal law. It's a Schedule One drug and controlled substance act. Okay, and the disability law. Uh, and in fact, the state statute itself says you're not required as a landlord um, to allow or facilitate the use of the Schedule One drug. Okay, and it's federal law trumps state law. Also, you can look to the regulations, and the regulations, um, the regulations that the Department of Public Health passed. You know, you have the statute and the state regulations. And the regulations say nothing in here. In fact, I think it's. Can you go two slides? Maybe. Go right here. Back one. So here's this, the state statute. Nothing in here requires a violation of federal law um, or purports to give you immunity under that. Right? So you're not required to violate the Controlled Substance Act here. Um, and here's what the state regs say. Nothing in here changes uh, the rights of landlords. This was added after landlords said, what about our smoke-free policies? Okay, so legally that's where you are. Has this played out in other states? Yeah, we've seen this in the state of Washington that had medical marijuana and there was an eviction and the judge said, look, what do you want me to do? It's, a, it's illegal under federal law. Uh, this can't be a viable defense to your eviction for medical purposes. Um, we haven't had cases here, so we may have more cases on this. Um, but that's the law as it is now. Here's a practical balance, right? Someone comes to you, has a medical marijuana card, 
and it says, I, I'm going to use medical marijuana. I need to use it. <coughs> you could say, okay, I understand. If you're inside the property, you know I have a no smoking rule. If you're inside the property, um, would you please use an edible form or liquid form, which the dispensaries are required to dispense. And these products are powerful and have a fast dose response. And because of that, presumably, can deliver the medical benefit and relief that some people may require. But as far as smoking it, you can say, okay, that's okay inside the building. If you want to smoke it, you do have to go outside and comply with the no smoking rule. I think that strikes a fair balance on this. And it makes your life easier because basically you're saying, I don't care what you smoke, take it outside. All right? Uh, so it's a pretty fair balance. Next slide. Do folks have folks seen these? The Can I just ask you one question yeah, yeah, before you go on? Please, yeah. Um, they're going to legalize it. That's that's pretty much given. Yeah. I, it's, I think is that it's gonna change enough. everything once they legalize it? At the federal level, you mean? State level. State level. State level. State level. Federal well the federal level State. still applies. The so federal law still well, it, well it does change things. So I mean so it's medical now, so it enjoys uh, a heightened level of protection, right? Because right? it's medical. Now that heightened level of protection is in conflict with federal law, so it's all mixed up. Once they make it totally legal, uh, presumably it'll be it'll be recreational, right. like more like cigarettes. Okay, so so that would it would make life easier as a lawyer. I'd say, oh, it's easier to answer that question. Okay. Uh, Management-wise, you may have more people using it, and you know you may want this rule even more so because you're gonna have more people smoking. Yeah, people um, that don't smoke cigarettes would be smoking. Maybe, maybe. We'll, we'll, we're we're going to see, we're gonna we'll see, see what, what happens, happens, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, we'll see what happens with this. I'm just afraid of the discrimination, though. You know what I mean? If you were, if you were to say something to somebody and they have the state right to smoke the <coughs> marijuana and you're saying no, it's just going to be there. Yeah. yeah. No, it's tricky. It's tricky. People are passionate about this, right? People are oh, passionate yeah. about it. So if you get that request, I've given you what I think is a legal response, but you know, I would suggest thinking it through covering all your bases, probably talking to your counsel about this. Um, because this is the first time, this is the first experience with this stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, so yeah. it's, it's new. Um, even a lot of attorneys are going to be like, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Most will be like that. Yeah? Are you in the process over anticipating the redoing the early information in your presentation regarding the effects of secondhand smoke of marijuana smoke? You know, interesting question. There's not a lot of research on that I'm aware of on the effects of secondhand marijuana smoke, largely because it's it was illegal. Right. But cigarettes were legal, and they're like, what's going on here? It's legal, but let's look at the effect. And it was 40% of our population smoking. The leading preventable cause of death, like more than Every year, more than all murders, all suicides, all drug use, all alcohol use, homicides, combined every year. That's how many people are killed by tobacco still today. So because of that, there's been a lot of research on it. Marijuana, I, I don't think there's been. I can't speak to that as much. But it's a combusted material. So I know that healthcare professionals are saying, if you can vaporize it or have an edible form, that's better than smoking. So there's probably some health effect there. Yeah. I went to a presentation recently by the head of um, thoracic oncology, a surgeon uh, from Bay State. And this was a subject, it was certainly the legalization of marijuana. He was talking about tobacco, but the legalization of marijuana, what is the impact going to be? What, what was the research? And she said the latest research that they have at this time, and this was about six weeks ago, was that one joint smoked as prescribed, which is inhaled and held in, is the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. A pack of cigarettes. So there have been, there's been very little research on the carcinogen, car, about the carcinogens in in marijuana and also the impact on its contribution to lung cancer. That, that will change, but what, what the initial research seemed to be um, demonstrating was the joint equal a pack of cigarettes. 
Yeah. Smoked, when smoked. But again, compare that to the medical benefit, you know, if, if administered through an edible. Or, so it's a, it's a complicated issue, um, but there are obviously effects in the secondhand smoke of it. Um, here's another product. That, and do folks, have folks seen e-cigarettes? I mean, how could you not? Yeah, these things are, well, first of all, who makes them? Cigarette yeah, so they're not cessation products. Okay, <laughs> they're not. They don't well, like have, little nips, though. They don't. They don't help you quit. Maybe you <laughs> use them instead of cigarettes. We're actually seeing a lot of dual use. We're actually seeing a lot of dual use, which is a big concern. These things are taken off with kids. Kids. They actually, they were legal to sell to kids until uh, not long ago, and then thanks to the Board of Health, you prohibited the sale to kids. Uh, some towns still have not done that. Uh, so the use is taken off with kids. All right. Um, they are certainly <coughs> less harmful than traditional cigarettes, but they're not harmless. And there's a range. These things are not regulated. Like a lot of products, these aren't regulated, like traditional cigarettes. So they can kill one out of 10 people, they can kill two out of 10 people, they can kill three out of pe 10 people. There's no regulation on that. Same with these things. All right, so you get a wide variety. You have some that have trace amounts of carcinogens in the vapor. And then you have others that have much more carcinogens uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the vapor that they emit. So you got a wide a variety here. Oh, they're all addictive. I mean, they, they pretty much all have nicotine. There are a few that say no nicotine, but I think that most of them have it. Um, and they come in these crazy flavors. Honeydew, watermelon, fruit juice, candy cane, whatever, blah, 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 on and on. Um, so what do you do with these? Right? Well, it's your choice whether you want to include them. Um, I think that, and what I hear a lot of landlords doing is they say, I don't care what it is, take it outside. All right? So they include e-cigarettes in the rule. The reason they do this is because the last thing they want to do is knock on someone's door and take a look at the e-cigarette and say, uh, which brand is that? Okay, you can smoke, you can use those, you can't use those. Or here, you have to use these different ones. Or, you know, that sort of stuff. So I think it's more cleaner and more consistent to say, look, take it outside. Now the truth is, some of these products, a very few, aren't like super candy flavored. And people may be able to sneak them in their units. But really, there's no violation if you're not aware of it, right? How do you respond to current problems? Someone complains, right? But if they're not, if you don't get a complaint or don't have evidence, then you're not going to do any enforcement. Same with here. So people might be able to sneak these, but if you do have an enforcement problem, you're just saying, take it outside. So that's what the landlords do. They say, okay, we're going to go smoke free. We're not going to have grandfathering. I'm going to do it around all my buildings. I'm not going to have a designated smoking area. I don't have a lot of area. Just go up to the sidewalk. I'm going to include marijuana, and I'm going to include e-cigarettes in my rule. So let's say that's where you are. And so let's go to the next slide. How do you implement it? Uh, I recommend implementing it through a lease change. And we'll talk about condos in a second, because they have a, pro a, a, a different process. Um, I'm looking for the model lease addendum. I don't see it. There's there. OK. Um, well, it's done through a lease addendum. We can send electronic copies of it. Um, there's actually a model lease addendum in this packet. Grab that one. This is a model lease addendum for public housing authorities. Um, Well, we don't need to worry about that. Um, so here's how, the, here's how the process is done. You have your model lease, you have your, your lease addendum, OK? And what you do is you make your decision to go smoke free. All right. Maybe you have a you know, tin approval. Maybe you have a board, something like that, or some other folks, partners or something. So you all make a decision to go smoke free. And what you do is you set a date one year in the future. So today, June 12, 2014, you start the process. Your effective date 
for everyone is the same date. It's that one year in the future, June 12, 2015. And throughout that year, what you're doing is everybody's re-signing when they renew their lease or recertify, that's when they sign the no smoking lease addendum. All right? And that happens maybe throughout the year. If you're month to month, obviously you don't have to wait a year. Still though, don't do it in one month or 60 days. Do it like 90 days or even longer. Because you want to do some education here. You want to give people a chance to get angry and accept the rule and figure out how they're going to comply with this rule. Um, is there a legal way uh, landlords can use other than the um, renewal of the lease agreement? Because what I often see here in East Hampton is perhaps true, is a uh, landlord gets a new tenant and they write a lease for one year. At the end of the year, they don't renew it. The idea is that yeah, if I like this tenant, I'll keep her and I won't renew the lease. No obligation on me, the landlord. If I don't like this tenant in the first year, I have this lease, and if she violates the lease, I can kick her out. And so it's uh, kind of a little bit of a, a legal game that, that you know, landlords play. So, but the reality is that a lot of landlords don't ever renew the lease beyond the first year. And certainly don't do it on an annual basis. Maybe some do, but I think most don't. So what would you do in that case if you're a landlord with that practice and you probably have no intention of ever writing leases again? Okay, so you're, yeah, you're outside the first year. Then your tenants are presumably their tenants at will. Yes. So they pay monthly. Legally they would be. So, so you legally your lease term is each month, right? And you kind of renew your lease. Yeah, it goes to the 30 day. Yeah, so you're, you're at the 30, 30 day. So that one you can go much faster. You, okay. you, you still have to give notice, right? If you're in a month to month situation or even a tenancy at will, you got to give notice, hey, uh, I'm going to increase the rent by 50 bucks. I'm going to. You got to put the trash cans here. I'm going to. I'm going to do this. This. And hey, here's a copy of the no smoking lease addendum, which you're going to be required to sign. You know, when the lease renews or the 30 days. You know, whatever it is, and it's going to be effective for everybody at this date. Okay, so they can for for those folks they have tendencies at will month to month. They can go faster if they want, but. But do have the time in there um, because really the most important thing you can do enforcement wise is to spend a little time in the beginning telling residents why you're going smoke free. So for market rate it's not as important okay, because they can kind of relocate it more easily. But for affordable properties education and resident engagement is critically important. So surveys and resident meetings and information about cessation services. So you don't have to quit residents, but if you're interested in quitting or learning how to cut back, there are a lot of cessation resources for you. We actually have a few things on the table. Uh, so those types of meetings, even if you are smoke free already, have those meetings now. Bring that cessation person in to talk about it now as a, as a follow-up. Um, that's the real reason to having that extra timeline. You know, there's illegal stuff you got to worry about it, but that's you really want to work on the education because you're worried about enforcement and compliance. Um, one thing I want to point out in the lease, and I can just describe it. And by the way, this is in condo docs too. You have a no smoking rule. You don't have a smoke-free rule. Okay, there's a difference. Um, you're not going to guarantee that it's a smoke-free environment. You're going to do your best to enforce your no-smoking rule, but you can't guarantee it's a smoke-free environment. What if you're on public sidewalks right outside the window and smoke comes in? You can't stop that. It's a public sidewalk, right? Uh, what if you do have someone who violates the rule? Well, you're not allowed to go pull that person out right away and put them on the street. You have a whole process there, which can become complicated, right? Uh, so you actually, in the lease addendum, you disclaim any responsibility for this, and you say, I'm not a guarantor of smoke-free air. Yes, I have a smoke-free policy, but I'm not a guarantor of smoke-free air. Um, so that's an important thing in, the, uh, in, in the, both of the amendments for a condo and for, uh, um, for rental properties. Let me talk a second about condos, too. Um, their process is also easy. But <laughs> politically, maybe not. Legally, yes. So here's the process in a nutshell. Okay. 
uh, it's you got to have a vote. Right? You have to have a certain percentage of the ownership say, yes, we like this rule. We agree to amend our master deed and our trust. And once you hit that percentage, which is typically like 75%, it varies. But once you hit that percentage, you can amend your master deed and trust. These are the documents that created the, the condominium. And it can be binding on everybody, including residents that have lived there and smoked. Okay. The reason that's the case is because when someone buys a unit in a condominium, they buy it subject to the rules in place at the time of purchase, providing the reasonable rules, and rules, reasonable rules that are put in place in the future. Right? If condos didn't allow that, they would not be able to keep up with the change in society around all sorts of different stuff. Okay, so there's got to be a process built in to allow for that change. Uh, and, and it's there. So it's typically the way it practically works is trustees get interested, do some research. They hold a meeting for all the unit owners, the condo association. Um, people comment. Then the trustees say, okay, we're going to have a vote. And the trustees sometimes send out the ballot with a letter saying, you know, we think this is a good idea, but it's your choice, so please vote. Some trustees prefer to remain neutral. I encourage trustees to actually take an educated position and recommendation. Why not? They're trustees. They have a fiduciary obligation. So, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that they can do it and should. Uh, then they do the vote. And the hardest part is actually getting people to vote. I mean, that's the hardest part of any election or any type of thing. So, you know, they have to, sometimes it's knocking on doors. It's not just a day. It's a week or even a month takes a little bit of time. Let's assume they get the vote. Then they can file the amendment at the Registry of Deeds, and it's effective on filing. Um, and then we talk about enforcement. So let's go to enforcement for rental properties. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Do you have information on insurance rates versus smoking and non-smoking properties? Yeah, really good question. Um, another potential benefit. Um, I know a few insurance companies have advertised um, a discount. Unfortunately, they're not in Massachusetts. <laughs> All right. I have heard of people going back to their insurance companies and negotiating a discount. Typically, it's around the fire. There's an allowance for reduced risk of fire, things you can do to reduce the risk. And there's a there's an allowance there. And so I've heard of people getting a reduction. Definitely ask your, your insurance broker. Ask about this. Um, the, uh, a few more things on affordable properties. So I mentioned that education is critically important. So a lot of site-based meetings, engage residents, offer cessation services. If you have some resident leaders, <coughs> tenant council, work with them, engage them. Um, bring in partners from outside, health centers. Talk to visiting uh, nurse associations and other service providers. Say, we're smoke-free, so if your folks are on our property, they can't smoke. They can't smoke with their clients because a lot of home health care aides uh, have been known to smoke with their clients. That's got an end, right? These people need to know too. Obviously, your staff can't smoke on the property. It's not just residents can't no smoking. It's everybody no smoking. Um, and um, you know the other stuff about the lease change. So education is critically important before implementation, during, and even during enforcement. Um, and I would say even in a market rate, you want to, in a letter, when you notify people about this, you want to talk about why you're doing this. You know, you don't want to have people think this is arbitrary. You know, dear resident, we will be going smoke-free as of this date. I'm doing this because I believe there are important health and safety benefits to this. This is a trend in, in amongst uh, landlord properties. Um, so you will be asked to sign a no smoking lease at the end when you get for this. You know, it shows you're thoughtful, right? It shows you're engaged. Instead of, hey, here's a no-spoken lease addendum. You're going to sign this. Or you're going to move out. That's not a good way to deliver it. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, I guess we'll get to enforcement. I forgot this stuff. Challenges. People think this is a violation of their rights. Um, it's a tough change for folks, no doubt about it. All right, someone has smoked their entire life. Maybe they've lived in this unit for 20 years and they've smoked. We're asking them to, 
change this behavior, this behavior that's intertwined with a powerful addiction. So it's not easy, but it's doable. Um, but as far as the rights, well, look, um, juxtapose two rights here. The right of someone to smoke in a unit, and the right of the person, rights of the person in the neighboring unit to actually be able to breathe. You know, let's say they're asthmatic, and they can't breathe when the neighbor's smoke comes in. Which right do you think is more important? Right? Both rights are real. Yeah. Would you say secondhand smoke violates or interferes with a neighboring tenant's right to quiet enjoyment? There have been a few cases on that, yes. Yes. Uh, there was a case years ago, before we even started talking talk about smoke free housing, it was in Boston. A tenant lived over a bar, and there was a lot of smoke coming up. So it wasn't just a little bit of exposure, it was a lot coming up. And the judge said, violation of quiet enjoyment. Landlord, you're in trouble, and you get your rent free and plus some other stuff. Um, so there is that type of case. I, I understand there's a case in Springfield right now that's involved that that's involves a similar type of claim. Um, I don't know any specifics about it. Um, I'll talk about. Well, I'll mention the other legal liability now. I'd be more concerned with the person who has asthma, right, and says, "Look, landlord." I know I have a disability, I qualify under disability law, I can read it in the statute myself, and I know you have a responsibility to accommodate my disability, thus I want a smoke-free unit. And you go, uh, okay, I'm not smoke-free, i got a one-year lease, what am I going to do with your neighbor who smokes? Ouch. That's a tough case. That's a tough case. Uh, I think there are other more important reasons for going smoke-free, but if we're talking about the legal liability, it's something to consider, and I'll talk about it, some cases on that. Um, but you know, individual rights. People are angry, but they don't have the right to smoke in the unit. Okay, um, uh, at least not past the lease term. If you properly change the lease, it's your property. It's you get to set the rules for it as long as it complies with the law. Staff buy-in, you get some staff sometimes, or visiting home health care aides. You know, they don't really buy into this sometimes in smoke. Uh, concern about other quality of life issues like drug use and stuff. Why are you going smoke free? We're dealing with illegal drugs in the property. Why would you do this? Well, you know, secondhand smoke is still pretty dangerous and it's something you can do a step towards improving the health and safety of your building. Why would you wait and not do it? Um, but you do get these, this pushback, right? Um, next, next slide, please. Um, all right, so we're moving to enforcement and just some general things. Uh, this is enforced like any other rule. Okay, you're not randomly knocking on doors. It's complaint driven. Um, when you go smoke free, you've done the education. You want to now respond quickly to any violations that you have. That lets people know that you take it seriously. Hey, my neighbor's smoking. Okay, uh, can you put that in writing? and I'll go take a look. That means a lot. Um, put, up those, put up signs. This is a no smoking building. If you have ashtrays right at the front door, those outside, those weird goose neck looking ones, um, move those away from the building. You know, you have a smoke free property now. Do the things that make it look like a smoke free property. Um, next, next slide. Okay, so same, same sort of thought. You know, education, cessation may be continue. You've got to educate a lot of folks. You've got no smoking signs. Financially responsible, that's security deposit. Um, designated smoking area away from the building. Ask residents to inform their guests. They're legally responsible for what their guests do. But it's tough sometimes when mom is going to have her son over and her son smokes. Mom doesn't want to chase her son out of the building because the son never goes to see mom. <laughs> So, but you do have to tell mom, you know, we have a smoker property, you can tell your son this. Yeah? Did I misunderstand you? I thought you were making a point early on about the importance in housing situations, like group housing situations, like kind of to call it a no smoking policy rather than a smoke free 
policy. Yeah, oh, did I call it? Do I have well, smoke everywhere it says smoke free. I mean, in the oh. literature, it says smoke free. There, it says smoke free. I'm confused by. Maybe I just misunderstood what you meant. Yeah. Or is that just shorthand for. It, I'm sorry, for it's, sh it's shorthand and it's something that needs to be changed. Okay. Something that needs to be changed. Yeah, but the legal stuff, when you, when you, you, know, when you do this, uh, it's got to be no smoking. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's keep going to the next slide. Um, I don't think you'll see this, but you may. Uh, you go smoke free and you get a notice from a doctor that says, my client, my patient needs to be able to smoke. Uh, this happened in the Milford, Connecticut Housing Authority. The day after they went smoke free, like six years ago, uh, a healthcare provider from one of the residents sent a letter to the executive director and said, my patient needs a waiver from a new rule because she suffers from anxiety, depression, and some other things like that. And so uh, the executive director responded by saying, okay, uh, we need some more information to process this reasonable accommodation request. Among the other questions he asked, would you please point to the clinical guidelines that recommend smoking as a treatment for these conditions? They don't exist. Smoking is not a treatment for any physical or mental condition. Stop. End of sentence. No exception. You have old timer, I don't want to say old timers, but it used to be, all right, go smoke if you got it. You're stressed out, go smoke a cigarette. That's not a medical recommendation. Uh, plus, so anyway, so there's no nexus between you have a condition and smoking is a treatment, right? There's not a nexus there. Uh, plus, if you were allowed, if you had to allow someone to smoke in the property, that fundamentally alters your property, right? You have to do a reasonable accommodation, not an unreasonable accommodation. So the limits to what you'd be required to do. Um, but really, this, I, you know, I've heard this is rare, the reasonable accommodation request. Um, and once I've heard about it, been denied. And I haven't seen any litigation on this. Um, here's the other case. This is a litigation case. This is before any places were going smoke free again. Someone in the Cohasset Housing Authority sued the Housing Authority for smoke coming into their unit. And the judge, I'm paraphrasing, basically said, you know what, that's a good claim. But the irritation in your throat, that's not enough. If you had asthma, you know, I'd let this thing go to trial because I think it's a good claim. But you don't, the facts here don't support it. So that's basically what the judge said, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. This is, you know, someone can make a claim out of this. And in fact, there are some cases of people doing that. There's a, there's a litigation down in Florida, um, several years old now, where uh, a resident was sent to the emergency room like three times in a HUD property. HUD stepped in and sued the manager of the property because this person's disability asthma was, being, was not being accommodated. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't want you to focus on the litigation side of it, but if you're worried about accommodation, disability litigation, this is where I think you may see some problems. Um, and I've talked to a lot of lawyers who've represented people in disability claims. Um, so, uh, let's go to the next slide. Evidence, evidence. Um, I should say before we start getting into enforcement, too much more, that evictions are rare. Compliance is really high. Most people like this rule, want this rule, and if given a little education and know about it, it's like a speed limit. If you didn't post the speed limit, people wouldn't know what it is. With education, people like this rule and to a large extent comply with it. Okay. Um, maybe it requires a warning letter or a second warning. Well, maybe they had a party and someone smoked. You know, it's these sorts of infractions that you, you may have. Um, but let's say that doesn't work. Your warning letters don't work. If you're a housing authority or affordable property, you've had a sit-down meeting. That hasn't worked. You've done all the creative stuff of reaching out to the emergency contacts, the service providers. You sort of work with this residence network to try to achieve compliance. And that doesn't work and you move to a lease action. Okay. Um, what sort of evidence would you need? 
right? Well, the judge has a tough job. The judge has to believe somebody and call the other person, you know, a liar, right? And on top of that, the judge is being asked to put someone in the street. And that's tough. And that's tough. So some thoughts about the evidence. First, you want to have that very thick file that describes everything you've done to go smoke free. Your Honor, I have bent over backwards to implement this very important health and safety rule. I started this, Your Honor, because there was a fire. Hold up the clipping from the newspaper in town. I was next to that property. I didn't want it to happen to mine. It was caused by an unattended cigarette. And there's all this information. And we took a year to implement. And here's a notice. Here's a signed lease addendum. Here's the education we've done. We brought in this person. We brought in the fire department. Whatever. You've done all this stuff. So you're telling a story that you didn't just say no smoking and then came right into court. You've really done a lot of work to bring the residents along. Okay? That's important. Uh, also important is the detailed description of your enforcement. So, Your Honor, we had a written complaint. We went up and inspected. We smelled smoke on this date. Uh, the second time, I had another staff member went up and, and checked for smoke. He's here too. He's going to testify. We were given permission to go into the unit where we observed an ashtray in the property, saw that. There were several burns around that weren't there when we rented the unit. Here are the pictures of before and after. Remember, you have to have permission to go into a unit. Um, all of that type of evidence is very persuasive and very important. Still, though, the judge may not allow it. Right? You may get before the judge, and the judge is like, and said, Your Honor, will you just give an order? Will you please instruct the resident to comply with this rule? And that way, if you have to appear before the person again, the person's not just ignoring your rule, but ignoring the judge's order. Okay? I understand eviction and lease action can be difficult. And actually, I don't want to see anybody be put on, on the street. Um, but you do have to put this all together to demonstrate how hard and extensively you work to, to have this person comply with the rule. The one thing, if you do move to eviction, what I'm suggesting that people do is not just get the four cause eviction, but agree to an agreement or dismissal right before then where the resident can relocate without having that four cause eviction on their record. Okay, I'm thinking more about affordable properties here and, and, and uh, housing authorities uh, because we don't want that resident to be denied shelter or things like that. So that would be one thing that I'd suggest is a good move. I get asked a lot, uh, is there equipment to measure smoke? Yes, there is. Um, I've actually heard not a lot of people using this, but let me go through some of it. The first one is like a, a so folks have a, are you familiar with like radon, those radon detection? You take the top off, you put it out, it sits there for a while, seal it up, send it off to the lab. You got one of those for secondhand smoke too. And it's a few hundred dollars. And the problem is you gotta kind of sit it out there for a few days. Um, but you get, a, you get a report that's you know, legally defensible, focuses just on nicotine in the air, um, and I've heard of people using it. Another thing people use, and this is more common, is a particulate sensor. It's like a little device, they're not that big, and it just senses the particulate matter. Um, there are a lot of things that produce particulates, so it can be, you know, there can be some problems. But you do a measurement here and here, and right outside the unit owner's unit, and you see a spike of particulate matter. And so you can kind of infer from that they're smoking inside. There's a product too where it's a, like a little vacuum and it pulls in a little air onto this filament and then the filament is sent to a lab and there's a report on that. Um, and then there's a final product that's not on the market yet. It's like the size of a cell phone. Uh, and it senses nicotine right off the bat. It just beeps nicotine in the air. Uh, that one's not on the market, um, but my understanding is, you know, it will be. Uh, again, I don't think you need this equipment, but maybe you run into a situation where, you know, you're unsure. You've done everything. You've got your HVAC person trying to identify where the smoke is. You've got the complaints, but you're still not sure, and you don't want to move to a lease action without it. 
that's your call. Um, I'd say most people do move to a lease action or take a course without this stuff. Um, but again, remember, most people comply. And even if you don't get 100%, your property is going to be that much safer and that much healthier with this more <laughs> free uh, rule. So what's next slide, please? I'm not sure we can We can keep going. This is that disability case in Florida I mentioned. Um, before I talk about trends, let me talk about enforcement in condominiums. It's actually much easier. The way they do it is uh, first offense, they send, and this is just general. This is not, you know, it's not required across all condos, but generally what they do is they'll send a warning letter. Then if someone violates again, they send a, they issue a $100 fine, which automatically becomes a lien on the unit. And then maybe they have for a second offense $200. And for a third subsequent offense is $300. So you can imagine $300, $300, $300 day after day, a lien on the unit, that's a significant deterrent. I've heard enforcement in condos is not a problem at all. That's what I've heard. Um, and, you know, because of that fact, you can issue fines and get this. And then you can get a court order if not. Yeah? Well, I, you know, for my own situation and others, I, other friends who live in different condos, the, the difficulties having the trustees do yeah. do we have a management company that the trustees tell them what to do and they're not on site so there is no management on site and um, the trustees I don't think are consistent about enforcing any rules we just get sort of the yearly newsletter don't park here everyone parks there and nothing happens so okay. I'm, yes yeah. yes you're right the the big but, difficulty is. Um, getting these volunteer trustees to go smoke free because they have to they have to support it um, and then um, they can be a little um, how do I phrase this correctly a little bit uh, they don't devote a lot of attention to, attention to enforcement they just kind of gloss it over it um, but if they were focused and devoted on this they have the tools to do it. Right. And I believe they have a fiduciary obligation to enforce the rules. So you as a unit owner can say, we went smoke free, we have this rule, you are obligated as a trustee to enforce the rules, please do this without making me, you know, jump through hoops here. I'm just asking you to enforce the rule that was just passed. Um, easier said than done, but that's your, that's your argument. Um, Trends and regulation. There's not a lot out there. Okay, we have a few municipalities in California that have done things like, hey, if you have multi-unit dwellings with more than one level, uh, then it's got to be smoke-free. Um, you have a few places that have done things like, before someone moves in, you have to tell them that you are that you allow smoke to be created. <coughs> the idea is. They'll say, oh, I don't want to live here. I'm going to go live in this, in this building. I don't know if that works. <laughs> but that's the idea. Um, and then you have Utah doing, a, doing some things. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of out there. Not out there in the sense that they're crazy, but out there in the sense that they're unique, that uh, not, not a lot of people are doing the rules they are. Um, what we're really seeing is this trend is, is voluntary. Okay, uh, I mentioned the uh, the housing authorities that have gone 26,000 plus units. Um, I know the large management companies like Maloney and Beacon and Peabody and Corcoran, they're shifting their entire portfolios in Massachusetts and in other states. Um, and then market rate properties, uh, we're seeing a lot of them go smoke free too. So really this is a trend. And I think it reflects the fact that we have um, uh, most people don't smoke, right? And our multi-unit housing stock is going to start changing to reflect that fact. So we're going to have more and more places go smoke-free, and then we're going to have a small percentage of places that don't do anything. And they're just naturally going to have more people who smoke. And so we're going to have this division in our property. When that happens, I don't know. Maybe it's five or ten years down the road. Most places will be smoke-free. A few places will have a lot of smoke in them. Um, I think that's where we're headed. And, and who knows what we'll see at that point. We may see regulation at that point, I'm not sure. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, any questions? Did I cover everything? Could you sleep? It's late, isn't it? It's seven thirty. <laughs> okay, so um, please fill out the evaluation um, and and definitely jot down your email because we can give you this stuff electronically. I'll give you a copy of the lease addendum. I actually see I have the wrong lease addendum here. So what I'll do is I'm going to take this up and I'm going to send you send. Uh, Jackie and Sandra, who organized this, uh, a copy of the, um, the the electronic copies of all these documents in the market research report and stuff, and they can distribute information to you. And if you have questions, you can email them back, and you know you can connect with me. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And you all see we have a lot of food left. So okay. Yeah, yeah, take yeah. some food. Yeah. Can you get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? Too? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Um, I have a question about the fire regulation because I think the outside yeah. smoking is an issue where I am because they smoke yeah. right under my window. So is there some way to, you know, I want to use that as leverage with the, just with the trustees. Um, yeah, it's from the fire marshal's office. I don't have it yet. Yeah, it's from all the street off the building. Yeah, so what is it? Six or more units. Six or more units. All she's got to be able to build. Or if it's concrete, right? So I'm on the street side. Yeah, 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 I'm on the I would Google, I would Google, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. Evaluations.